Hello, I'm Rachel Savage, Artistic Director of Vamos Theatre, and I'm going to talk alongside photos and film clips about where I find the inspiration for our shows, about the structuring of them, about the rehearsal process, and about our work during COVID times, all with the main theme of nothing about us without us. <laughs> I write shows about themes that I'm passionate about, giving a voice to those often without one, and all through non-verbal full mask theatre. And with each show, I'm guided by people who are living those stories, and they guide me in the rehearsal room and in the writing and the research process. Um, over the years, we have covered themes as diverse and potentially dark as forced adoption, end of life, dementia and post-traumatic stress in the military. So let's start with how I find the inspiration for each show and it's always through inspirational people. So what better place to start than having a chat with Penny Greenland whose stories, experiences, the words, the gifts fell from her mouth and that was the inspiration behind Finding Joy. Thanks for joining us, Penny, to talk about the making of Finding Joy and where the inspiration came from. Um, so we sat together on the sofa. I came down to Suffolk. We sat on the sofa. Uh, you talked. I typed. <laughs> Audrey sat beside us asleep a lot of the time. Yeah. And for anybody that hasn't seen Finding Joy, it's, it's a love story. It's a love story between a grandson, 17-year-old, 18-year-old grandson, and his grandmother who's living with dementia, and about how that grandson became the most incredible carer. Um, it's a true story based on Penny's mum, Audrey, and Penny's son, Rowan. Although our character of Danny, the grandson, was a combination of both you and Rowan. And I was lucky enough to, to listen, to watch most of it was watching and to learn um, and all of that work from the Making of Finding Joy has since then inspired our working care homes and our work with carers. Um, and I think that it's probably important, Penny, to mention that you're not just Audrey's daughter. There's another reason why you inspire people, which is because you are Artistic Director of Jabodeo, and that has come with a lifetime of work that has inspired people, in a nutshell. Okay, we're a team of movement players, dancers, acrobats, developmental movement specialists, and our passion is uh, how we live in this body, in a culture which actually really respects and values things of the intellect, and amazingly often ignores things of the body. So we train care workers in dementia settings, we train early years practitioners and teachers in special needs schools. Those are the three sort of areas that the body seems to be so important. Great, thank you, Penny. Let's look at some of the scenes together and talk about where the inspiration came from. Audrey's handbag was, it was her world. It, uh, it was kind of the holding object that she always knew and understood. So as everything else disintegrated around her slowly and she understood nothing about eventually about what was happening in the outside world. The handbag was still the same. It was still the same object that she'd held in her hands for years. Audrey making meaning from a, a touch and a hold, and the meaning she makes is dancing. Here 
here comes the hot water bottle. Splendid swap. Well, this was also you in rehearsals with us saying, you know, you've got a hot, you've got a hot water bottle here. It's great bargaining power, use it. My goodness, it was. I can't tell you the hours of sleep that hot water bottle bought me in the middle of the night as a way of encouraging her back to bed. My goodness, you do capture what a sweetheart she was. And I realise this isn't everybody's experience of looking after somebody with dementia. And you say about her being the sweetheart, but actually I watched her and Ro together. I watched how when he walked in the room, her life lit up. Yeah, she absolutely adored him and he her. <clears throat> and he's a sweetheart too, yeah. It's just... He was a natural, he was exceptional in the way that he cared for her, but why? Why did she light up when he walked in? I think it's an energy thing. I think it's an energy of youth. Way back, way back, when Abby, Rowan's older sister, was 18, 14 months old, I was working in a dementia unit, filling my way. And there was one man I couldn't contact, but Abby at 14 months could. And I think that was an energy thing and a memory thing, a sensory memory. There's some sort of sensory memory about how we behave with young people, that we don't need to do the same thing with older people. I mean, I should say this, there was the joyous occasion when she said, who are you? And I said, I'm your daughter. She said, no, I don't have one of those. I said, well, you do now. And she said, well, how lovely, how very nice to meet you. <laughs> I remember that time when that bloke was came in to fit the lino in your kitchen and he was there and I just remember Rowan with Audrey just kind of dancing past as he was as he was fitting the lino and that bloke's jaw just dropped onto the floor. But he did say afterwards, that was amazing seeing him with his grandmum. It was amazing. <laughs> This was really challenging to me, actually, getting home and finding the house looking like a teenager's bedroom and sounding like a teenager's bedroom. Telly very loud, football. And my, my mum, ex-head teacher, blue stocking, a very contained woman in the middle of it and I used to have to battle is this appropriate and and I watched it one day and realized that uh, it was me that was out of kilter she was holding her own absolutely fine <laughs> That's beautiful. She had no idea what they were doing, but that instinct to um, mirror is so strong because then you look right. Um, absolutely, yeah. Her boys. And there'd be cans of lager on the table. On one occasion, several half-eaten pizzas. This is the reference from other parts of the show where Danny discovers that she'd had a little white dog all of her life. That's a great What is this? What is this thing? What is it? Oh, no clues. Ah, clue. <laughs> and this is the point of beautiful genius on behalf of these boys. Again, just following that person. If you don't follow the rules, but you follow the person, what joy there is to be had. So, 
And I mean, I so admire the other boys who watched Roe and followed him. She would tell herself um, gently. She'd let us know if, if, if things weren't right. But the things I expected that she might tell herself about, which is like having half-eaten pizzas in boxes, didn't trouble her at all, whereas they absolutely would have done in a previous uh, time. Time to go home. Yeah. I'm watching the football ground. It was such an important match. <laughs> this particular occasion, it was. was a great joy watching the boys take her out in the car, automatically put their hoods up because they were hoodie boys, and her making meaning and putting the hood of her little Daymart anorak, which she adored, putting the hood of that up too. She would often say, I want to go home, uh, no matter whether she was home or not. I mean, we, we would always be at home and she would say, I want to go home. In other words, I want to go back to where feels like home. Home's an image, home's a, home's a feeling. Um, I want to go back to that feeling, please. I've had enough of this one. Um, and that requires journeying. So the journeying can settle the feelings. And there's something about coming in through the door again and going, oh, we're home, and doing all that stuff, like putting on the kettle and hanging your coat on the peg that says I'm home. Um, and settling in with the hot water bottle and the handbag and the comfy cushions. Um, so yeah, better the journey than the battle. Actually, you being there was hugely important because I realised in those days that you silently watched and watched and every so often I looked up and there were tears rolling down your face. You saw something that, and, and affirmed by your presence, something that few carers have. As a carer, you are invisible. You are inside the house, you're, and, and, you know, and, and a lot of it is in the dark of the night when, when you're feeling you're most desperate because you want to be asleep. Having somebody watch you as you go about your routines, putting somebody to bed, getting them up, putting them in the shower, it was so affirming. And it enabled me to do more of what I had done. Just thought I'd say that. So you can see why I wanted to tell that story. It's a story that needs to be told and I wanted to tell it to the world. And we did. We toured China, Norway, across Europe, the UK. And in my mind, our most recent show, Dead Good, is a kind of sequel. My best mate died when we were both 27, so I avoid talking about death, about grief. Why would you? So when a fan of our shows, a Dr Maggie Keeble, emailed me and said she wanted to meet, she wanted to talk about the theme for my next show being end of life. I thought, yeah, right, I'll meet you, but there's no way I'll do it. Maggie Keeble's very passionate and persuasive, and I soon realised that when she talked about life and priorities and empowerment, she was right. 
there was another show that needed to be told and that show was about end of life. So I immersed myself in the research. I visited hospices and I went in so nervous. I was quiet and shy and uh, respectful and surprised. Mary Stevens Hospice had music blaring out. It was full of life and laughter and fun and the radio was blasting out and there was activities and when they said what would you like to drink they opened a cupboard and that cupboard was full of every single kind of gin imaginable and then I met Ruth the sister and Ruth is the most genuine and generous human being and all she wants is to make anything happen for people at the end of their lives so when there was a gentleman who who'd loved horses she arranged to bring horses to his window. Um, she talked about people who want to be held at the end of their life. And she's fine with that. She says, budge over, I'll get into bed. And she holds them. There was even a woman who, in the last hours of her life, she was with her boyfriend and it was Valentine's Day. And she said, I always wanted to get married on Valentine's Day. So Ruth makes it happen. And then I visited another hospice. I was invited to go along to the men's space group, which met every Thursday. And it was a group of men who met for banter and chat. They were all terminally ill. Sometimes they had people come along and carry out activities. And that's where I met Nick and his mate Pete. And these two were as similar to the two characters, Bob and Bernard, that I'd already started to write about in the show imaginable and at the end of that session Nick came to me and said I'd really like to become involved I've been a consultant all my life and I think I could be a consultant on this and he was right and we met for 12 months and I've got a document called Nick's notes and every meeting that we had uh, I wrote notes within that document he came into the rehearsal room the notes went into Nick's notes um, and he had such a huge impact on that show and he changed it. He changed the way uh, it became, became more outrageous and more funny and more loving and more honest. And I'm gonna read from Nick's notes um, so that you can see the way that he influenced every tiny detail and each scene. Nick says, I must admit to the feeling that you want to misbehave to be outrageous. I guess it's all part of wanting to live life to the full. This certainly comes after the shock, disbelief, anger, depression. Once you've come to terms with your situation, you just want to make the best of whatever you have left. The only real restriction is physical capabilities. Black humour is definitely something that I started to embrace, especially during the men's space group meetings. You make fun of illness, of symptoms, of medical necessities and of death. One example was when a lady came to a session and taught us how to make potpourri. She said that the scent from one particular combination of dried herbs and flowers could last for three years or more. One member shouted out, well, that's not a lot of use to us then, is it? We all creased up. It's like the naughty schoolboy scenario again. It's challenging society and its norms. You feel that the rules no longer apply to you. There are still legal limits, but even those become a bit blurred.
Dead Good is about friendship, male friendships, and Nick talked a lot about uh, his friendships at the Men's Space Group. In his notes, he says, you have to reflect empathy, a shared experience, bonding, the fact that they're coming to terms with their situation together. But one lesson must shine through. Have fun whilst you still can. Life is precious. And like Nick and Pete, Bob and Bernard, our characters in Dead Good, are from very different backgrounds. Uh, Bernard has a classic car collection, whereas Bob is a mechanic. But through classic cars, they find that shared experience that Nick talks about. film to tell that story in that scene. Why? Because I didn't want to use physical theatre, I didn't want to see a, a car on stage told through physical theatre, I didn't want to see that trick again. Uh, in my opinion, mime and mask don't work, so I couldn't do that. I didn't think full mask and film works, but Daniel Hill convinced me that it could. And then I also realised that I've got two friends, Sheila and Dave, who were balmy enough to let us borrow and drive their classic car in full mask, where you can hardly see a thing. To complete Dead Good, Nick says, I'm lucky that I've already realised what's important in life. Tolerance, love, respect, Intimacy, not just in a physical way. Empathy, all important. I want to develop new and perhaps deeper relationships with people. I want to care and be cared for. It does come full circle in a way, back to the newborn needing to feel the touch of its mother, the safety and security of her arms. Dead Good is a celebration of life and it asks the questions. Is there such a thing as a good death and can we plan for one? Dr Maggie Keeble argues you can and yet in Covid times it's become too cruel, too brutal. Nick and I talked for hours about death. He didn't get the death that he wanted. He died during the first lockdown in a hospice um, where he was allowed one visitor, his wife of course, who was allowed to visit just one or two hours a day. And our friendship continued to the very end, 20, 30 sometimes WhatsApp messages each day. And of course I could see. <sighs> when the messages were no longer read, Dead Good was cancelled, but it will tour again when we regain our right to live well and to die well. In 2016, I was approached by Daniel Bockroyd, the then artistic director at Colchester Mercury to make a co-production. Um, and Daniel mentioned that Colchester is a garrison town. So 
if I'd like to, the theme could be about the military if I was interested. I wasn't interested. Well, um, I'm left wing. I'm anti-war. Uh, I've got no personal connection to anybody in the military. So I wasn't interested until I read an article in The Guardian about Danny Fitzsimmons, an ex-soldier whose parents first found out that there was a problem when they found him in a wheelie bin at three o'clock in the morning and it made me ask questions. Why did he think that bin was the safest place to be? What drove him there? And how would it feel for a parent to find their boy in a bin? The research for each production takes me about two years and early on, with a brave face, I read a book called Aftershock and learned about a soldier called Aaron Black, whose trauma was rooted in watching his best mate being blown up. And Aaron never recovered from this and tragically took his own life. And in 2012, more military and ex-military took their own lives than were taken on the battlefield. The army gives the most gruelling and demanding training to become a soldier over many months and years, and yet there is no cohesive government policy to retrain soldiers on how to become a civilian again. And not all soldiers come back mentally scarred. Many say the military years were the best years of their lives, and they enjoy a smooth transition back into civilian life, and yet, Thousands return physically whole, but emotionally shattered. Veteran Ray Anderton helped me write A Brave Face. I met Ray during a mass-making residency that I was leading at Colchester Help for Heroes headquarters. Um, we spent two days during that mass-making residency and at the end of it, he said he'd really like to become involved and he became an integral part of the team. And A Brave Face owes so much to Ray and his shit experience of post-traumatic stress and Ray spent so much time uh, through the drafts after draft of each script and then in the rehearsal room. And we took a lot more fag breaks when I could tell that actually the honesty that he shared and the advice that he shared got too much, especially around the subject of children, children in war zones and children back home. But it was because of Ray's honesty that we received such great reviews from military personnel, the reviews that mattered for this show. Um, one said, having served two tours of Afghanistan, the realism of the emotions returning home and the struggles to normalise were exactly portrayed. I have never experienced a more accurate depiction on the effects of war. And that's why the core belief of nothing about us without us is so important and crucial to this company and in the making of shows. But I do put the actors through it. 
At the RSC, we held a chilled performance um, of Finding Joy, where the first three rows were full of people living with dementia and their carers. For the dress rehearsal of Dead Good, Nick turned up with all of his friends from the men's space group. But the hardest was a brave face when we performed in Hereford, where the SAS turned up. They sat on the back row, of course, but the end, at the end of the show, they said, don't you ever point a gun in my face again. And I said, I'm sorry, it's theatre. When I told Ray, Ray said, don't worry about the SAS. Okay, Ray. Ray would have been talking to me uh, during this talk, but he's now a paramedic in the NHS. So he's busy. Very busy. Ex-soldier Rhys Jenkins Hayhow also came into the rehearsal room and he taught the actors how to move. It was always a really exciting day when he came in. See if you can spot him. So obviously the wall will be there, you don't want to show anything yeah. here. Josh will be there, so you have both your hands on the back there. Go around there, and if my rifle's fine, I'll take them out, and then you've got to stay behind them, because if there's an IED there, you're back. Um, but say if like, I pull the trigger, I've got a stoppage, so then Josh will the inspiration for our 2016 production, The Best Thing, came from an article in The Guardian by Yvonne Roberts. <laughs> It told the stories of several unmarried mothers from the 1960s who'd had their babies taken away from them at birth or shortly afterwards due to the pressure from the church or from their parents or from society. And they were often shipped off to another part of the country to a mother and baby home. All the women that I spoke to felt that they had no other choice. There was no other option. Why, well, it was the best thing. The best thing for you, the best thing for the baby. Sign here. My research included several articles, novels, films and of course interviews and I also found interesting adverts from the time from maternity girdles to an ad for the duffel coat, perfect to disguise the growing waistline. So, structure. The structure of shows change all the time in rehearsals and sometimes right up to the last minute. So in the story of The Best Thing, it starts with a funeral. But we decided to start the show with a real high energy prologue that was also a flashback. Almost all of our shows have got choreography in them as a different way of storytelling and to give a different energy. Um, our masks made by Russell Dean have got tiny eye holes so the actors have got no peripheral vision which means when you perform a dance it's like dancing with a bucket on your head. There's a lot of counting that goes on under those buckets. <laughs> was about many mothers, but in particular about a couple. A couple who'd been going out with each other for two years. They were going steady. But when she fell pregnant, 
her parents banned her from ever seeing him again. This was easy to do in the 1960s without mobile phones and social media. They stopped phone calls, they stopped the meeting, they split them up easily. The parents believed that he wasn't good enough for her. He waited for her in the same place where they always used to meet every day for two years. He was interested in fashion. He moved to Australia and became a millionaire. The excitement is intense. The crowd in many places is soft. But the 1966 World Cup final is underway. Another part of my research is, of course, around the real historical events that occurred at the same time. So, winning the 1966 World Cup was a gift because it also helped add some much needed humour using the well-known football commentary. In this film, also look out for the iconic front cover to Lady Chatterley's lover, always hidden in a bag, of course. And to help understand this film, Susan has had a total makeover in the previous scene, a makeover that her boyfriend hasn't yet seen. This is the fourth World Cup final I've seen, and in the previous three, the team that scored first lost. those stories into something cohesive that works on stage. Stories that have been told to us using words and now we have to tell them without words. Um, we've got an incredible team of associate artists including Alan Riley and James Greaves who between them have got 70 years or more of full mass theatre experience and people think that full mass theatre doesn't have a script because it's silent. This isn't true. It does. It's called the internal monologue. And when we rehearse, we rehearse speaking. And we speak economically and connected to our bodies. Over to James Greaves to show us how it's done. Right, how are we looking? Nice and sharp. Somebody coming. No. Oh dear, oh dear, sweaty, sweaty hands. That won't do. 
Go and do just stay calm and look good. Right, how are we looking? Nice and sharp. Somebody coming. No. Oh dear. Oh dear, sweaty, sweaty hands. That won't do. That won't do. Just stay calm and look good. So work during COVID, thankfully, has been very busy. During the first lockdown of 2020, we received a BBC commission, which we called How Hard Is Waving? It was inspired by a combination of finding joy, but this time with the family, still including a grandmother and a grandson, but now trying to stay connected over video calling. It was also inspired by a new friend of mine that I'd made in my local care home during lockdown, who I went to see each day just to wave at her window. And this film is the final of 20 episodes which went on to inspire a national campaign to try to conquer loneliness in care homes just by simply encouraging communities to wave. So during the second lockdown, I started to make a show that could be performed outside care homes and it was rehearsed outside care home windows, written and performed by myself and Cirque du Soleil clown, Sean Kempton. And it's called Love Through Double Glazing, our fourth co-commission with the London International Mime Festival. It has three recognisable characters who residents would expect to see in their care homes an armchair fitness enthusiast, a chef and a window cleaner. All played by Sean, out of mask, each wild anarchic clowns. And I play Florence, who rules the roost and plays havoc with each clown that dares to step on her territory. Oh, and there's a performing dog, emerging artist, Nora Savage. But Sean and I are most interested in the feedback and reactions, which then reshape the next show. Our first care home manager said, make it more naughty, it's what they want. And so we have, in fact, every show has become more and more outrageous and the wilder the show, 
the more wild and unlocked the staff and residents seem to become. One staff member came out and said, I can't believe how much the staff needed that, let alone the residents. And two carers, during another show, ran outside and started dancing behind us. It's as if this stupidly potty performance releases months and months of fear, anxiety, misery and boredom. Walter, 84, said, I can't believe it, I feel alive again. Sheila, 86, said, he's a cheeky young man, but if I were younger, he wouldn't know what had hit him. Alice, 94, said, I laugh so much, I ache. With all Vamos Theatre Productions, it's my belief that if I can make people feel, I can make them think. And maybe influence opinion. It's my reason for making theatre. But we make theatre with people. Nothing about them. Without them. So to finish, uh, here's a little film that's daft, because there's not enough silly in the world. It was filmed during the first lockdown. Um, I dragged my daughter out of bed and said, come on, let's go and make a film, because I've just heard the Queen make a speech where she said, we'll meet again. I look forward to that. See you soon. <laughs> Again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Keep smiling through, just like you always do, till the blue sky.